system. Hello everyone. I'm extremely delighted to welcome you to our first webinar on how should we write Yoruba. I'm Marian Wallace, lead curator for Africa at the British Library. I work in the Asian and African collections of the BL, where we have large collections, especially of printed books on Africa. Today's webinar reflects the inspiration and hard work of Kola Tubosan, who is a current British Library Chevening Fellow. It's been my privilege to supervise Kola over the last year when, among other things, he's been investigating our Yoruba language collections, which he'll tell you about later. I'm also very pleased that the Lagos Studies Association and Africa Rights, which is the literary festival of the Royal African Society, um, are both partnering with us for this event. I'd like to thank them and the illustrious group of presenters and moderators that Kola has put together and everyone involved in organizing the event. I'm also delighted to report that there are over 400 people registered for this event, not only as far as we can tell from Nigeria, the UK and the US, but also from other countries, including Kenya and Jamaica. Many of you are Yoruba speakers, and we are also glad to welcome others interested in the broader questions we hope to raise today. So without further ado, let me introduce the moderator of today's event, Adekumi Olatunji. Kumi is a language enthusiast whose interests include French, Spanish, Mandarin and Japanese, as well as Yoruba, which she studied on the SOAS uh, MA Linguistics program last year. Since graduation, she's been developing learning materials for other Yoruba heritage speakers like herself. Kumi, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Marian, and uh, welcome to everybody here uh, for this online symposium grappling with the question of how should we write Yoruba? I know it's one that I have also been thinking about um, on my course and subsequently. So um, we uh, just a few administrative uh, points. Uh, we will have a question and answer session towards the end. But that doesn't mean save your questions for the end. Please, as and when you think of them, use the Q&A uh, function um, or the chat to write down any questions you have for our, our panelists. Um, so we have four wonderful uh, panelists, pan panel members here for you today uh, who will be uh, presenting for 10 minutes. And I've been told to be very strict about this 10 minutes. Um, so I will remind them uh, that they have 10 minutes to present. Um, if you want to have a look at the, pro the program and their uh, synopsis of their talks, um, it's just been posted by Dr. Marion Wallace in the chat section. Uh, so uh, without further ado, um, I would like to introduce our first speaker, that's uh, Mr. Kola Tubosun. He's a linguist, creative writer whose language work and interests focus on um, Nigerian and African language documentation and digitization. So currently the um, Chevening uh, Scholar, uh, sorry, not Chevening Scholar, Chevening British Library Fellow in the Asian and African Language Collection. His talk is entitled uh, Yoruba Orthography from Ajayi Krauger to date through the collection items at the British Library, progress and problems. So Kola, I'll pass it over to you for your 10 to 15 minute talk. Thank you. I can't get my video to come on. I need I need some help there. Okay. Hello everyone. And I'm very glad to be here. I have 10 to 15 minutes, so I'm going to try to get straight to it. Um, I am very excited to be here and to discuss this subject that has uh, consumed me for a very long time. And um, and share with many of my uh, ogas, uh, my professors and mentors who have looked forward to up to for a very long time. Um, let me start. So um, I hope you can see my 
presentation. Wait for it to show up. Okay, so I'm talking about Yoruba language um, orthography from a Jai crowd to date through the collection items of the British Library. I've, like I, um, they mentioned, I have been a research fellow at the library since September, and this um, continues the observations I've made, both through the work, uh, the works that the library holds and Yoruba language writings I've seen in all the places and through my own work in language technology. So that's what I intend to go through. I'm going to run through this a uh, couple of uh, number of slides, it has so many things. I'm going to try to skip the, uh, the technical parts so I don't waste uh, valuable time. Yoruba is a major language spoken in Southwest Nigeria. Many of you know that already. The conservative estimate of population is uh, 30 to 40 million. Um, and it's spoken in Benin, Nigeria, in parts of uh, South America, et cetera. Now, um, a typical Yoruba text looks like this today. This is from a paragraph that I translated from a short story by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Um, it looks like this. And in there, many who are not familiar with this kind of uh, text would notice um, there are critics, like the signs we put on top of letters and under it. Um, you also notice uh, sounds like this GB, which is pronounced G, which many uh, non-Yoruba speakers uh, typically have problems with. This uh, particular orthography came as a result of several years of um, tweaking and change and evolution from the very beginning of Yoruba writing. Now, Yoruba letters look like this. Diacritics on top, marks underneath. The marks underneath typically are to show the vowel quality. But it hasn't always been this way. Like I said, the first Yoruba language uh, writing looked like this. This is uh, a translation of Luke 135 by Jai Crowder. And that is, It's not written this way anymore. Of course, many people who look at this will find this really strange, uh, who are only familiar with current writing. It will be written like this today. Even though many people would, ask, would want it to be written this way, or don't know any other way to write it except like this. You would find many young people and uh, many people who write and publish today writing without any of the markings instead of uh, the way it is like this. Many of, of them also don't have the tools to write it, which is why they're writing like that. This is the reason why we put diacritics on Yoruba writing. This is a sample sentence on top here, um, which you can pronounce in several different ways depending on what kind of tools you put on it. Baba Minyokunla is the most common, most uh, reasonable way to look at it, but there are several other ways you could look at it technically. And if without the tone markings on it, you can say so many different things. The 31 here can go as far as 51 or so when I try to find it. Um, again, we go back to Crowther and you would notice on the left how Crowther tried to write many of these uh, words. Ekun, he wrote it like that. Ekun, he wrote it like this. Ekun, he wrote it like this. Today we write them like this. But when Crowther did, um, I suspect that, you know, he was trying, he was working with the missionaries to try to, um, to make sure people can read and write the language. So they didn't pay as much attention to the systematic nature of the language. So you would notice the first and second one, there is no reason to, to assume from looking at it that this is A and that this is uh, A uh, in the other one. There's nothing there that particularly shows it, but here in the new one, you can see that A is demarcated with the dot under it and A is shown this way. There are many other examples of how Crowder used to write the language and how we write it today. Um, the short story of how the language came to be written down, um, you can find it by reading uh, J.F. Adeyaji, how Yoruba was reduced to writing. He noted many of the problems and many of the fights and conversations that they had. Um, but mostly there was an international conference in 1854 where linguists and philologists and direction of missionary societies came together and decided that they were they needed to have a harmonized way of writing the language. In the early 19, uh, 20th century, many of the uh, suggestions they made then started showing up in writings, like this uh, Bible by the CMS, where you would find the diacritics underneath, but nothing above it, where you find this tilde on top of the E here, um, which continued in many of the writings you find, which you, when you find this one uh, on the uh, verse five, which is N before the W-O-N, you won't find many of these in modern writings today, but these were the writings they found uh, they did in those times. Um, the tilt particularly remained for a long time. Um, look at the tilt on top of the E uh, here. Um, and then, you know, writings, usually just the letters with very little sparse uh, markings. Fargo in 1950 continued the same way. You would look 
uh, you'll find examples of this same tilde here, Omar. We've changed this now um, to you know, um, different ways of, 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 of writing it. In the 20th century, in, after Fagunwa, um, around that time, a new effort came, uh, headed by Professor Yobangbushi, who wrote uh, Yoruba orthography, and then suggested many new changes to the language, many of which were adopted by the Federal Ministry of Education. Um, he said that we should remove the tilde, change it, um, replace it with, uh, diacriti uh, with diacritics, um, the way the language is spelled, remove double letters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, today, many of um, these words will be written in, you know, different ways because we have, you know, decided how you know we want them to be written. Bangbush's standardizations and suggestions were brilliant because they kind of brought logic into the language and they helped provide a kind of uh, background to many of the work that we we'll do in the 21st century where computers started becoming relevant in the writing of the language. Um, they created a basis for the text to speech and many other things. Um, but there are some other problems that he didn't fix. So for instance, when you say Gongo today, um, why do we write it with an N, uh, with an A and not an O, uh, uh, not an O? Uh, why do we write an one with an O and not an A? Uh? Many of these issues are things I found when I started using computers to try to understand Yoruba phonology. Uh, the issue with the N, nasal in Yoruba language, is also something that I've also grappled with. The N in Yoruba it's, it can be three things. It can be nasal, uh, a signifying, uh, signifier of a nasality, like in this, um, like in you know, Gunde or Gunsoya. But it can also be a, a letter in itself, like you have in uh, a nomo, where N is just a consonant. And then you have it as a syllabic, where you have it in like Ogunde. But when you write Ogunde, where N doubles as both a nasal and a syllabic, then there is a problem. Most people write it in the, in the first, in this first spelling, whereas it's best expressed as a second one. So these are issues that come up when you're trying to bring some real logic um, and, and continue the work that um, Van Boucher did. Like this, look at these names, for instance. On the left, you have the most, uh, most uh, common spelling of these names in Yoruba today. Oyenusi, Olamison, Hajimati, Adenike, Anuluapo, Unibio. Tinubu, but you can't tone mark them with the way they are spelt without including new vowels. Um, but most people don't write them as you find on the right here with the extra vowels uh, that need to make them uh, possible to be able to mark them with the, with the markings that uh, are provided. And there are a few other issues that remained also from that 20, 19th century work. Um, so 21st century, uh, 20th century, there were a lot of other issues with publishing um, where the language started becoming less important in society, uh, people were not teaching them in schools anymore. The government emphasizes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then you have books published like this, 1979, where the texts were written and published, and then somebody had to use the hand to include to, to include the diacritics and then reprint it again. Um, there are other examples of a work like this where you find that by just looking at this, you know that you know this is a combination of both the, compu uh, the computer or the typeface they had then and somebody using their hand to write it. I've had first-hand experience with this as well when my father published a uh, Yoruba newspaper. So 21st century, there are a couple of other issues that, I've, uh, that I have found now as an adult working in uh, technology and language. One of them is that on in the internet, there are a few tool, tools to write with proper diacritics. We had to invent one uh, with the Yoruba Names Project. Sometimes when you write on Twitter, which had a strict character limit, diacritics were often counted as separate characters. So when you have 120 characters, you put a diacritic, it counts as one, as one. Unicode is part of this problem because they didn't create, they didn't allow Yoruba to be written with pre-composed characters. I wrote a lot more about this in uh, my essay on Debe, which you can read uh, later. I'm, we're gonna post it on the chat. Um, so there's a number of issues. Again, when you search for a name, for instance, on Twitter, uh, on, on Google, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, if you put the diacritics, you find different, different results. And if you don't put diacritics, you find different results. These are some of the issues that we deal with today uh, because of the problems of the lack of harmonization of how Yoruba should be written on the internet. And then you have the lack of, uh, you have influence of English, um, where people start then funkifying the way to write their own language and stuff like that. These issues, uh, these particular ones, uh, are a result of the Unicode problems I mentioned earlier, which I'm going to talk about if I get a chance much later, where, um, instead of using the proper diacritics in Yoruba, we are forced to use like things like this, uh, you know, um, strange characters under, 
or when you write properly, you have uh, the tone marks jumping around like you have find in this example. Another one is the fonts where, you know, look at the way my name, uh, the fonts in my name jumped around and became bigger and smaller, you know, just because the computer doesn't quite recognize how to deal with uh, these particular issues. And then online you find young people, maybe because they don't know how to write the, the language or because they don't know, um, they don't have the tools to write it or because they're just willing to just push the boundaries and make the language even more, uh, more, I guess, adaptable to their own current modern circumstances. They start writing Yoruba with the English language forms that look like this, which remind me actually of how Crowder used to write it at the very beginning. I guess Karim Baba is going to talk about this. So a few examples I found online a couple of uh, uh, days ago. And then people writing their names in funny ways like this. I found this on Facebook. These are the names that they want to write in brackets, and this is how they write it online. So what I'm thinking about um, while I, I was trying to uh, set up this uh, webinar is to raise particular questions about how Yoruba should be written in the future and in the present and how technology can help and whether we do need new ways of writing language whether, or whether we need new non-Roman scripts that can help uh, better harmonize the problems that we've faced so far from the 19th to 21st century. Um, and also probably even cater to issues uh, that arise from the fact that people write the language differently like Benin or you know, in, in the Americas, maybe a pan-Yoruba way of writing that kind of covers all the issues um, that exist all around. How can we bypass the issues with Unicode? Do we need a new conference or Yoruba orthography? I guess this is kind of a precursor to that. And what would that entail? especially also uh, education and writing. And before I go, let me give you a few uh, things I found online that made me laugh the last couple of days. When you try to search uh, translated, uh, translated Yoruba expression on Google, um, usually if you don't put tone marks, it's gonna give you a terrible answer anyway, like you can see here. But sometimes even if you put the tone marks, it still gives you something really, really uh, ridiculous and sometimes funny. Everybody tags me on this on Twitter all the time, but usually because they assume that I work on Google Translate, but I don't, uh, I found it very interesting. This is the last one as well, a quojometa, which is a greeting we say in Yoruba, which certainly does not mean you died in three days. So I hope this conversation uh, that we have brings uh, us to raise some of the issues that exist and find probably find solutions uh, to many of them. So thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions. Great, thank you very much, Kola, especially those uh, Google <laughs> mistranslations at the end. Very, very um, amusing. So um, I think, uh, thank you very much everybody for uh, submitting some of the questions you have. Um, we will be taking them as we go along and each panelist will be uh, speaking first. We'll have a conversation um, and then Q&A at the end. So thank you for submitting your questions. Please continue to do so. Um, just in the interim, a uh, quick one. Um, a couple of people have asked about the uh, video being available. Yes, our plan is to make it available um, on the British Library YouTube channel. Um, okay, so um, I would uh, like to uh, introduce our next speaker. Um, uh, which is, who is uh, Professor Karen Barber. I've had the pleasure of meeting her a few times and uh, uh, being tested on my Yoruba, tested and trained on my Yoruba with her. Um, Professor Barber is a cultural anthropologist um, and academic, currently the Centennial Professor at the London School of uh, Economics. Uh, she was trained at the then University of Ife. Um, so consequently, uh, does not regard the Yoruba diacritics as a pain. Uh, but a source of great satisfaction and joy. Her talk is entitled uh, the, Pleasure of, the Pleasures of a Well-Marked Page. So uh, please, uh, when you're ready, uh, Professor Barber. Oops. It's saying I can't start my video. Okay. Right. Thank you. Well, well, thanks to Kola, Marion and the British Library for setting up this, this webinar and for inviting me to join it. It's not often that you get an opportunity to discuss your orthography with fellow enthusiasts. 
And thanks also to Kola for that absolutely stunning introductory um, statement, which more or less covers every single thing I think we're going to be trying to discuss. So as Kumri just mentioned, I acquired my respect for their critics at the University of Ife, which is now Obafemi Awolowo University, where I did my PhD. And where later I was lucky enough to get a job in the Department of African Languages and Literatures. Now, not only did my supervisors teach me how to write down the Oriki texts that were the focus of my research, but also once I became a lecturer in the department, they put tremendous emphasis on teaching the incoming first year students the use of tone marks and sub dots. It was absolutely central to the program. It was non-negotiable, it was indispensable, and it was something that I completely internalized. And that's why I'm trying to share my screen. Share. Okay. Can you all see that? So this is what gave me my uh, great pleasure and satisfaction in contemplating a well-marked page of Yoruba. This is a novel by Oladejo KDG. This is the first page. Look at that, isn't that beautiful? Yeah, I mean, Yoruba orthography, which as Kola has just told us, was developed over more than a hundred years of expert consultation and debate by the Yoruba intelligentsia. It is consistent, it's economical, it's comprehensive, and it's highly informative. So that sense of completeness when you see a page like this is aesthetically satisfying as well as very useful and informative. So I find it odd that so many people seem to think it just doesn't matter. Now, you could argue that no orthographic system is really completely informative. It can't be. It always relies on the reader bringing a certain amount of knowledge to bear on it. And that's why it's been possible for so many writers to communicate and so many publishers to get away with publishing Yoruba without tone marks because they leave it to the knowledgeable reader to recognize words and to fill in the information that's missing. And that actually has worked quite consistently over quite a long period. So for instance, the, um, my current research is on the Yoruba language newspapers of the 1920s, at which time everybody used sub dots very consistently and accurately, but they hardly ever used tone marks and they relied on a knowledgeable readership to be able to decipher it. And it, as far as one can tell, most people were indeed able to do that. And as you've seen, as we just saw in Kola's presentation, Fagunwa has been read by generations of enthusiasts without hardly any, there are hardly any tone marks in the original versions of Fragunwa. It's only later that new editions were produced where tone marking was considered essential. So people who don't like diacritics could argue that full orthography is only important to people like me people who don't have sufficient contextual knowledge to supply the missing information, people who only began to learn the language as an adult, 
or the many diasporic Yoruba who are not fully immersed in a Yoruba speaking environment, or the increasing number of kids whose parents have dissuaded them from living in the language with all its incredibly rich and varied repertoires. But in, against that, I would say, actually, in a sense, we are all learners. We're all lifelong learners. Nobody can ever know the whole of a language. And everybody can continually expand their knowledge. And we do this as much from books, or perhaps even more from books, than from conversation. Because it's in books that brilliant writers have preserved and revitalized choice metaphors, idioms, sayings, special vocabulary, as indeed uh, Okediji and Fagunwa and many, many other writers did so brilliantly. Now, without full diacritics, we wouldn't know what it is we're learning. What is this new word, we would ask ourselves? Without full orthography, it isn't a word. Or it can't be realized in our minds and memories as a word. And it's not all just about knowledge and information. It's also about the aesthetic dimension of creativity and play. So for instance, if one day Abimbola had written his transcriptions of Ifa divination verses without tone marks, we would, got, we would get texts looking like this. What does that look like? It doesn't seem to convey anything much at all. But when you look at the way one day Abimbola wrote it with full diacritics, you can see the musicality, you can see the balance, you can see the harmony of this Ifa verse, which is just important as the, the, um, the meaning. So to my mind, there's no argument against using full orthography, but as we've also just heard, there are obstacles. And to me, there are two really major obstacles. The first is the lack of availability of good guidelines, good manuals, good teaching for people who may be in doubt about what full orthography involves. Many people just haven't been taught how to write Yoruba and they feel afraid of it. And secondly, the lack of availability of software that's quick and easy to use across many different platforms. So to use in email, social media, PowerPoints and in text files. And my experience very often has been that you write in one mode. For instance, you might write an article carefully putting in all the tone marks and sub dots send it to your publisher and they read it with a different tr system which turns it all into little square boxes and stars and exclamation marks. So my hope, and I'm hoping very much to pick up some crumbs of information from the table of all the experts which you have gathered around the table of this webinar. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Barber, for that very uh, illuminating talk. Um, I wanted to very quickly, before we move on to the other um, presenters, just respond to one question, which was um, whether we can have the webinar in Yoruba language. Um, it would be great <laughs> um, if we could, um, but the, the fact is we have other people here who for Yoruba is not there their first language or they're not fluent in it, they're not um, 
able to understand and keep up, myself included, if I'm honest, if this webinar was held entirely in Yoruba, uh, I would struggle. So in, uh, in the spirit of inclusivity, um, we're held, holding this uh, webinar in, in uh, English. If, however, you want to write Yoruba, please feel free. If you have uh, the software to include the diacritics, then um, all the more reason to uh, show off. Um, and if you could also then translate it into English for people who are not uh, familiar with reading the language, that would be great. Okay, um, on to our third speaker, um, Dr. Tunde um, Adewola. Uh, he is a, a humanist, uh, human language technologist and the executive director of the African Languages Technology Initiative, um, ALT-I, uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, which is a research, one moment, um, a research and development agency, which was set up in 2002 for the purpose of uh, developing the necessary resources that will facilitate the engagement of um, sort of ICT in African languages. So um, his talk is about language as technology, a Yoruba perspective. So I will hand over to you, uh, Dr. Tunde um, Adewola, for uh, your talk. Thank you. Um, do I need my camera on? I, I'm not able to switch my camera on at the moment. Thank you. Yes, my name is uh, Tunde Adibola. Um, I'm a human language technologist. My concern is to make sure that uh, technologies are available for as many African languages of the world as possible. Um, <clears throat> the title of my presentation is Language as Technology a Yoruba perspective. Let me start by explaining what I mean by technology in this context. Uh, fundamentally, technology exploits natural principles for the betterment of the human condition. And for, in my understanding, language is a system of symbols that describe the realities experienced and expressed by a people. Uh, and I, uh, I make the point here that uh, the language that expresses the experiences uh, ex uh, of a people is of necessity affected by that experience. Because it is what you want to express that determines the language in which you express it. Every language of the world uses phenomena encountered in the immediate environment. So we find that every language is affected by the environment within which it was developed. It, every language is affected by the realities that it is to express, and every language is affected by the experiences of the people that the language is supposed to symbolize. All languages use consonants and vowels to create minimal pairs to distinguish between words. Many languages include tones, many Asian languages uh, particularly in Africa, very many African languages, uh, tone languages. Um, but the Yor Yoruba uses tones rather heavily. Yoruba depends on tone in a way that many other languages do not depend on tones. And the consequences of this heavy use of tone are uh, rather interesting for the language. Let me just take some time to describe Yoruba tonality from the point of view of a 
human language technologies. Your tonality is found within other tonalities of many other languages. So many African languages are tone languages. In Nigeria, it is probably only Fulfulde that is a non-tone Nigerian language. Most other Nigerian languages, if not all, but for Fulfulde, use elements of tone to distinguish between words. Now, many neighbors of the Yoruba people speak tone languages, and many of these tone languages are uh, use two tones, sometimes a third tone, which is restricted, what is usually referred to by linguists as two tones and a down step. That's a situation in which there is a third tone quite all right, but that third tone does not occur except in certain environments. But Yoruba uses the three full tones, three full tones such that the three tones can be found in any environment. There are no restrictions for the three tones of the Yoruba. In Yoruba, vowels occur freely. But each time a consonant occurs, a vowel comes with it. So consonants do not float around in Yoruba. They are always bound to vowels. And you will not find consonant clusters in Yoruba. Now, every vowel of Yoruba, and therefore every syllable, carries one of the three tones of Yoruba. Now, I'll um, go into a little mathematics of Yoruba tonality. I have said that Yoruba uses vowels freely, but consonants come with vowels. So there are very many single, vo single vowel syllables and many consonant vowel pair syllables. And any of these vowels can manifest in any of the three tones. And each of these manifestation can represent a meaningful word. So it means that you can have one syllable that can, uh, of uh, consonant and vowel that can manifest in three ways. For example, ba is to perch. Ba is to hide. Ba is to meet. So we have this consonant vowel pair and the tone that rides on it determines what is meant. So the tone constituting the, um, the, 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 the minimal pair. Now, with that single vowel, a single syllable that can manifest in three different ways and can mean three different things, every extra syllable applied to that syllable multiplies the number of word possibilities by three, which means if instead of one syllable, we now have two syllables, there are nine possible manifestations of these two syllables. So if you put another ba, b, another b, you can have ba ba, which is like um, uh, ba ba, uh, ogi ba ba, ginecon. You can have ba ba, uh, father. You can have ba ba, and you can even have the uh, loan of the person that cuts your hair, Baba. And if that tone is not properly reflected, what is said can be lost. So in this kind of circumstance, therefore, you now see that every extra syllable that you add just multiplies the number of possibilities by three. 
So two syllables produce nine possibilities. Three syllables will produce 27 possibilities. Four syllables will produce 81 possibilities. And it is not, it may not be every time that every one of these possibilities means something, but more often than not, you'll find uh, the, 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 the various possibilities having some consequence. Generally, therefore, we can say that n, syllable, n syllables will produce 3 to the power of n possibilities. So if you have seven syllables, for example, that would be 3 times 3 times 3 times 3 times 3 in seven places, and that will give you 19,683 different possibilities based just on tones. So the question, therefore, is probably this language could actually be spoken as a whistle talk because the tone is so important. And what are the consequences of this tonality? <clears throat> the first consequence is that a lot of meaning in Yoruba resides in the tones, just as we have a explained <clears throat> the same consonant vowel pair meaning different things just based on tones. The second consequence is that it could be dangerous to sing Yoruba words to foreign tunes. Abide with me, song to the English hymn tune. Abide with me may become, come, let us putrefy together instead of abide with me. Because translating abide with me to Yoruba produced waba migbe. But the melody of the hymn suggested waba migbe, wa jeka jogbe. Let us go septic jointly. So that is what I mean by it could be dangerous sometimes to sing Yoruba words to uh, foreign tune. Somebody once sang the song. He said, Innocently means what a friend we have in Jesus. And somebody casually replied, it's only the one on the way to Benin because there's a town on the way to Benin called Ore. And having sung that song, Ore Wulani Bi Jesu, as Ore Wulani Bi Jesu, it's like, what other Ore town do we have like Jesus? These are the contradictions that come with careless handle of Yoruba tones. Third consequence of this rich tonality is that speaking Yoruba sometimes sounds like singing. So the question is, was that speech? Was that a chant? Was that a song? Because of the intrinsic melody infused in Yoruba ordinary speech by the heavy use of tonality, find that Yoruba words sometimes, ordinary speech in Yoruba words may sound like music to the extent that many uh, Yoruba uh, poetic verses suggest the tune to which they can be sung. And if you do not take the tune that the word suggests seriously, you might just be saying something that doesn't make much sense. By virtue of this tonality, also the musicality of the tonality, Yoruba tones are sometimes expressed in a solfege system, a do, re, mi. And that's also evidence to the fact that there's this musicality in ordinary Yoruba speech. Of really, really great importance is the fact that Yoruba can be spoken with drums. Uh, many Yoruba people do know that a drummer can say things to those who understand. 
It was the scholar, um, Willie Bear, that said that the statement made by Yoruba Drum could sometimes be ambiguous. But to the educated Yoruba, the ambiguity is easily resolved. Just as the ambiguity that Karin talked about in the absence of tone marks in uh, Fagwa books, in the same way, just the use of tones alone sometimes is enough to convey meaning. So it is of extreme importance, therefore, to mark tones in Yoruba. I read an, uh, probably an anecdotal, anecdotal story, but it was reported in, uh, in a formal paper that uh, Henry Townsend, the uh, reverend gentleman that first, uh, that, that first put Yoruba in print, uh, put, brought a printing press for Yoruba in Abeokuta in the 1800s, was getting frustrated with the um, regularity and frequency of the need to change the dyes for the printing press. And he noted to Crowther that the diacritics wore out first and was trying to persuade Crowther to drop the use of diacritics. And uh, Crowther retorted, that whenever any of these diacritics wore out, it means that the whole character has been mutilated and the die needs to be changed. But you find that many people today still argue about doing tone marks. They feel it should be possible to read Yoruba without tone marks. Um, Karin Baba has done a wonderful uh, work, a wonderful job of explaining uh, that position. But what concerns me particularly now is Yoruba and information communication technology. Information communication technology started as highly specialist, uh, highly specialized uh, things in specialist, highly specialist environments. At that point, ICT skills were specialized skills. But today, ICT skills are no more specialized skills. They are no more merely professional skills. They become life skills. And any language for which ICT is not available becomes immediately endangered. But the foundational availability of ICT for any language is in the Unicode. The Unicode is the universal code in which every language of the world has, the, uh, ha has a system by which it would be uh, 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 typed on the computer. The Unicode is a very, very important uh, issue in computing because it is the Unicode that helped to stop the problem in which somebody prints something in, some, in Yoruba somewhere sends it to somebody else and it ends up gibberish. This is the role that Unicode has played in unifying the coding structure of various languages. But due to the lack of full understanding of Yoruba tonality, Unicode does not think it is necessary to provide unique, unique code points for Yoruba pre-composed uh, characters. Uh, Kola has a uh, mentioned this in passing, but this is a fundamental problem in putting Yoruba on ICT. Because when you, if you have to compose on the fly uh, a, a, a Yoruba character like the sub-dotted low tone E, there are myriads of ways you can get that. You can type an E first, put a sub-dot, put a low tone, or put a low tone force, put a sub dot, put an E, or put a sub dotted E, put a to low tone on it, or take a low tone E and put a sub dot under it. All those various possibilities cause confusion at the back end 
when one is engaged in natural language processing of the Yoruba language. Though this coding system remains, uh, it, it's usable, it is still a problem, and um, uh, entreaties to Unicode does not seem to have uh, changed anything. Well, but it remains of utmost importance to apply their critics to your writing, and we shall continue to try to develop software that makes it easier to uh, develop software that even reduce the, uh, uh, the, the, the quantum of writing involved, develop speech recognizers that can convert your speech straight into uh, written text, and uh, speech synthesizers that can convert your straight from written text to speech. As I said earlier on, Yoruba is so musical that when it is spoken, it sometimes sings. Just as Yoruba speech rings a song, so also would you find the diacritics dancing on the pages of a well laid out page. Karen has also talked about that already. So please preserve Yoruba diacritics. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Tunde. Um, I agree, we need to preserve these diacritics. Um, okay, so before we go on to the final presentation, again, I just wanted to uh, reiterate that uh, this symposium, a recording of this symposium will be made available um, on the British Library's uh, YouTube channel. Um, so uh, you can see uh, watch after if you have it uh, if you're missing some of it now or if you want to share it in the future you'll be able to do so via YouTube um, whether or not the slides will be available that's something we can look into as well okay so our final uh, presentation <clears throat> will be made by Professor Olufemi Taiwo um, he's based at the uh, Africana Studies and Research Center at Cornell University, Ithaca, New York. Uh, one of his aims is to expand the uh, African reach in philosophy and simultaneously to indigenize the discipline and make it more relevant to Africa and African students. So his presentation is titled, uh, What's Orthography Got to Do With It? Uh, doing Philosophy in a Yoruba Key. So, um, Professor Taiwo, I'll hand over to you for our final presentation. Hello. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> and can you see the screen I'm showing? Yes. Okay. So you see color and uh, Albert, you have turned me into a genius, right? <clears throat> because I've never done this before. Um, first, let me thank uh, Kola and uh, Dr. Wallace for saying yes to him when uh, he shared my late arrival uh, in this program. Uh, but I also want to accuse him of not, I thought he liked me. Um, when you call a malam to come and do something for Yoruba in Yoruba, you are really asking him to come and fall on his face. So thank you, Kola, for, for doing that. Uh, my presentation today has to do with what happens when we take the language into specific areas, especially when we're talking about theory making, when we're talking about philosophizing, when we're talking about analyzing and doing many of those things that advanced studies, you know, are supposed to permit us to do. So I'm not just talking in terms of enjoying uh, uh, reading, literary, you know, uh, appreciation and all that. I'm talking in terms of breaking down, doing analysis in the language, you know, in a very formal way. And if you have been following African philosophy, pretty much, 
uh, one of the problems is that people think that if they speak Yoruba, they are therefore capable of thinking and writing in Yoruba. And because most of what they write in the philosophy is not written in Yoruba, what you end up with are Yoruba words, phrases, especially proverbs, being incorporated into the writing with no attempts made at a granular analysis of some of the stuff that they deploy you know, in those writings. Yes, if there are philosophers on the list right now, I'm talking to you. Uh, we're dropping the ball. And I hope that what I share here today uh, clues people into the need for us to do some very, very significant investigation of our relationship to the language and show some respect to it. Um, several years ago, I was publishing a book and I told the publishers that the book was not going to be out unless they did all the Yoruba occurrences in the book properly with all the marks. They practically had to go out to get additional you know, software and so on and so forth. And I'm glad I did. And I said to them, when you publish a book in Sabo Croat, which is spoken by probably the population of Ibadan, if not of your state, you follow the rules. And when anybody writes in French, if the marks are not there, you're not writing French. So the attitude I take is, if you are writing Yoruba and the directly critical marks are not there, I'm sorry, you might call it Yoruba, but I don't think that you are writing Yoruba. That's really for me. Um, we should stop treating African languages as if they are poor cousins of other natural languages in the world. So let's act as if there is integrity to these languages. Um, so now, several years ago, I got into an argument in collaboration with a colleague of mine, Professor Olatunde Lawuye, who is at the University of Ibadan. Got into an argument with my former teacher, the late Professor Akinshola Akiwawa. Professor Akiwawa tried to do sociology in Yoruba, and he tried to create a theoretical paradigm for doing sociology in an African idiom. So he went into the Ifa divination you know, uh, system and brought out what he called the Ayajua Lashuada as the foundation, the fountain from which to draw these theoretical underpinnings. And the key word, the key word that he tried to turn into a concept for analysis is the word Ashwada. But you see, I said Ashwada. But that really does not capture it because Ashwada has at least two meanings depending on the tones that you are using. So there is Ashwada and there is Ashwada. So what I've done in this example, since then other people have joined the debate, but conveniently neglecting the fact that Professor Lawi and I already pointed out that Ashwada is not one word and that what tone marks you put will give you different meanings. And my argument is that if you are not paying attention to those, the analysis that you build on those wrongly characterized words cannot be sound. So let me give you the example. And when Kola asked me about this, I, I, I put together a few other examples. Let me go through those first before I run out of time, and then I'll come back to the Ashua and Ashua. Uh, look at Aye on the current uh, slide. Um, I have put four different meanings of Aye right here. And notice they all have the same diacritical marks, the same tones, but they all don't mean the same thing. And I am yet to see a philosophical analysis when people deploy some of these, you know, where there has been attention paid to the sophistication of the language and the real meanings away from translations into English that need to be taken seriously. Uh, here's another one, you know, two others. 
Enio, and Enio, and then you have Iyami and Iyami. Now, if you ever turn to your mother and call her Iyami, you who know Yoruba, you know that there's going to be an issue. It to be a federal case between you and your mother. But I have been at a conference where a professor was mixing both of them and really copped an attitude when they were corrected, you know, that the two things do not mean the same thing. But that's what happens when people don't pay attention to the sophistication of the language, you know, that they are deploying. And then when they pretend to be the authorities, you know, of course, I am not an authority, I am just saying, when we're using the language, let's not only use it correctly, let us show some sophistication in the deployment. Uh, you look at these five words that I've put here, re, 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 re. For each one of these, especially if you want to do epistemology, you know, re becomes very important because you know, that's what you see. And then you can begin to decompose what it is to see in Yoruba. And then when you come to really, there is something there that is on one hand about seeing, but on the other hand, it recalls something. So there is some measure of recollection. But of course, really is also what we use to describe something that's dirty which tells you that there's a connection between something that you've seen before, really, and something that is now reflecting the time that it has been there gathering moss. And again, because we usually write in English and just put the Yoruba in almost as garnish, we are never exercised you know, by these issues. Uh, so let me now go back to the main one that I want to talk about. Uh, when you say that something is Ashua, it is in the state of being together. We were near ye, tabi po Ishua. Um, but when you say that somebody is an Ashua, that's in the subject position, you know, as we say in, in, in English, or Olua, you know, for those who write uh, Yoruba. And the Opposite of Ashua is Aishua, that is to be out of, you know, that being, that state of being. Whereas <clears throat> the opposite of Ashua is Alaishua, one who does not, one who fails, you know, to Shua. Now this has implications for how you describe society, how you describe human nature, and the whole debate about Ashuada has to do with what exactly is the nature of society and what is the nature of those who make it up. So while you use Ashua as the state of being together, you know, in community, and you use Ashua as somebody who is striving to be in that community or who is a member of that community, who is a part of that community, when people begin to depart you know, from that requirement, it actually has implications for what kinds of ethical judgments we pass on them you know, in terms of individualism and communalism. And these have very, very deep foundations in Yoruba metaphysics, in Yoruba social philosophy, in Yoruba ethics. And I'm saying that the implications of failing to pay attention to these very simple marks you know, that are right there are that you end up with analysis that does not really illuminate. So for me, the question is not you know, whether there's any other way that we should be writing Yoruba. The question is, how do we get people at create the resources for more people to be able to do the kind of thing that I'm asking for, both as in respect for the language, but more importantly, as in respect for the business of educating the world. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you.
Thank you uh, very, very much, um, Professor Taiwo. Um, that was very, very interesting. Um, I have a lot of questions, but it seems so does everybody else. Um, we are actually scheduled for a short uh, interval, a short break, um, which I guess you can go and get a, a cup of tea or um, a bathroom break or whatever it needs to be. And afterwards, we will have a discussion with the panels, uh, panelists and also um, the opportunity for some people to ask their questions live, but I will also be asking some of your questions to the panelists as well. Okay, so we'll just take uh, a pause here for a few moments and uh, we'll rejoin, I guess, uh, in a few minutes. Lovely presentations. Okay, we're good to go. Um, yes. 
Okay, thank you, everybody. Uh, welcome back for anyone who went away. And um, looking forward to this next uh, part of the symposium. Um, we'll have a short sort of discussion with the panel members and then followed by the questions, um, questions and answers uh, that you have posed. Um, I just wanted to start, first of all, perhaps with um, Carla, you gave the first presentation. Um, can you speak more about the solutions that you think that can help uh, Yoruba and other African languages and perhaps other tonal languages cope better in uh, this uh, technological age? Yes, thank you so much. And I really enjoyed the presentation by my professor, Sadibola, Professor Baba and Professor Taiwo. Um, much of my work these days have been in um, following what Dr. Adebola says, making technology uh, more able to deal with our languages. And, and much of what I tried to do in the presentation was point out the issues I've come across um, and the questions about whether we need new ways of uh, fixing those uh, these problems or whether the script itself is what needs um, fixing. So on the, on, the other, on the one hand of the technology, um, we have tone marking software that, I uh, that we developed at yorubaname.com, um, the project I, I started in 2015. And if you go to writeyoruba.com, I put that in the chat room, um, you can download a, a tone marking software, which you can use on your computer, Mac and Windows. And if you use mobile softwares, you can download the Gboard, which I also worked on mm -hmm. while I worked at Google. Um, which helps you on the mobile devices to be able to put tone marks on your words. Uh, I think Keyman also does the same thing. So there are software solutions that hopefully become more popular and um, get into more use. Um, but I'm interested in even more questions about you know what um, new suggestions we can we can provide to Yoruba writing itself uh, to make the the script itself more uh, easy to learn and to be able to use, to, to easy to use in literature and in other spaces. Yes, would anybody from the panel have something to say to that last point, actually? Maybe um, to uh, Dr. Agwala, in the presence of sort of, in the absence of maybe government support um, in, in terms of big tech, um, how, how um, what can we do? Is hope lost? <laughs> um, may I? Please. Yeah. Um, what I have seen as the main problem actually has been the attitude of the speakers of the language. Uh, some years ago, I was involved in um, the localization of Microsoft Windows for Yoruba, Igbo Yoruba and Hausa. And um, very few Yoruba people felt there was a need. They, 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 they saw it as some kind of um, just some novelty, nothing of real worth. So the, the problem really comes from that end because by, um, by the end of the day, uh, I don't think Microsoft was impressed with the, take, the, 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 the uptake of the work that was done. Um, as for Government involvement, that's a, I think that's a really, really tall order. Um, people who understand what the problems are, people who know the consequences of not uh, getting ICTs to be able to, uh, to, to, to be useful in our languages need to roll up their sleeves and get software out there that can make these things easy, particularly taking the cue from um, developments in artificial intelligence, making it possible to have uh, speech synthesizers and speech recognizers that cut off the uh, manual typing uh, uh, part of it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the answer. Um, I mean, we have some very interesting questions that I think are potentially related. Um, let me see if we can call some of the panelists to actually, uh, uh, sorry, some of the attendees to actually ask their questions. Let me see if we can do that. Um, but before we get to that, uh, 
section, maybe um, to Professor Barber. Um, what do you, what would you say to those who think maybe that we actually need a new script for Yoruba? It's hard to imagine a script that would actually surpass the one we already have, which, as I said, has been developed and refined over a hundred and, well, by now, 150 years by experts and intelligentsia who, you know, have given deep thought to this. To me, it's a simple, efficient, um, informative and consistent system. What's amazing to me is that uh, Microsoft Word, whose symbol sets include the most extraordinary range of, of um, orthographies, can't cope with something so relatively straightforward as simply a, a Latin style alphabet with a few extra additions. I mean, why is it so difficult? I just don't understand why it isn't made um, really easy to use. And, and as Professor Adigbola was saying, you have to first type the subdotted letter and then add the tone mark, or you have to do it the other way around. Then they separate out when you try to copy and paste and you get tone marks without, without letters underneath them. I mean, why? Yeah, why indeed? I don't know. <laughs> but what I'm saying is I don't think it's a problem with the simplicity or consistency or comprehensiveness of the script. To me, it's fine. It's a question of getting a technology that can produce these relatively straightforward symbol sets without all the palaver. Can I say something? Please. Uh, let's remind ourselves the difference between French and Yoruba is that we have dots under certain consonants and vowels. The high tone and the low tone, you know, the accents are the same. Okay? Now, when you look at some of the other languages that these high-tech companies provide for, it tells you something about how they look at us. And that they look at us is not their problem, I'm sorry to say. As we say in Yoruba, when you have people who are actually advancing the idea that maybe we need a new script for Yoruba, where exactly does that come from? To what end? For whose purpose? What exactly is the problem with the present script, given how advanced it is now in terms of capturing the language? And it is only the academy, I'm sorry to say, that we have this anxiety. I've had this conversation with Kola and other people before. The amount of new words that go into Yoruba language every day, if you just listened to only the Yoruba speaking radio stations in the western part of the country will blow your mind. Which tells you that this is a versatile language that is forever expanding to accommodate ever new realities, but whose scholars are so irresponsible, they are busy kowtowing to whatever it is that Bill Gates wants. Instead of saying, we are a market of 40 million people. There's a lot of money to be made from paying attention to us and doing good business as a result of that. We are the problem. It's not the companies. I'm sorry. <clears throat> yeah, that's a very interesting point. Um, I wanted to uh, segue onto somebody who actually asked a question or made a comment about um, 
Ajami when we're thinking about other ways to write Yoruba and other ways to write African languages, there are scholars who are working or writing about and discovering um, about the Ajami system. So if I can invite um, Professor um, is it Amidu Sonny, uh, sorry if my tones are wrong on that, um, <laughs> Vice Chancellor for Foundation University in Ushubo, Nigeria, to ask uh, his question or make his comment um, on this, on this uh, topic. Hello, uh, fellow panelists. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah, we can Thank hear you very you. much. Well, actually, from Fountain University, not Foundation, anyway, it stands similar. Well, I think I just want to express my uh, appreciation for all those who have contributed so far. And uh, there are two basic things. Well, there is a blog by Professor, late Professor Adia Jayus, I will be able to share with you later on, that the earliest documentation of Yoruba language in any script was actually in Arabic script in the 17th century. And I will be able to share with you that. Thing. But beyond that, the problem of uh, documentation of Yoruba or using uh, writing Yoruba language has to do with the orthography. I mean, you have various dialects. And let me give you a simple example. In the Egba dialect, John Peel was with me some few years before he died, and we were trying to discuss that, okay, we have Li and Ni, uh, something Li in the Yoruba, for example, and but the Oyopu will say Ni. So there is that problem of uh, orthography and the standardization of the orthography will be very, very important and in evolving the standard or acceptable Yoruba orthography. Then again, the use of uh, the Arabic letters for Yoruba language, of course, which may be outside your current uh, uh, remit or discussion, is very, very significant in recent times because uh, international organizations, for example, the ISESCO, which is the equivalent of UNESCO in the Islamic world, was trying to evolve a new Yoruba orthography uh, for Yoruba language, but of course in Arabic script. But the problem then arose. Most of those who were employed on the project were from were not uh, were called the uh, peripheral Yoruba speakers from Ilori and whatever. I mean, we do not consider Ilori as the standard Yoruba language, so to say. I mean, you think of terms of Oyo, Axis, and things like that. So my question now is this, how can we now uh, make sure the correct or acceptable, because every uh, script will be correct, the acceptable or commonly acceptable script will be available. Particularly if you look at Nollywood these days, Nollywood is a very popular television or something, even in Bollywood, you see some of them speaking Yoruba language. And you wonder which, uh, if you want to transcribe, I mean, you have a lot of subtitles of some of these things. So how do we now evolve a standard and acceptable orthography that will be widely used in the media, in, 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 in authorship and, and stuff like that? And I think there's need to do more of this in terms of uh, making it uh, popular and acceptable uh, for academic, for academic purposes. Even in our universities, and this is just my submission. Thank you very much. May I? Please. May I? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Amidou, for that. I, I think we cannot make too much issue of dialects because every language manifests dialects. Uh, Any time that people are separated by time and space, the language they speak will evolve in slightly different directions and the issue of dialects will arise. Um, one point I think we are missing is that Yoruba is not written sufficiently often today. If there is more writing, there, if there's more interest in writing and reading Yoruba, there is a way that writing uh, develops some kind of standardization. And it is this, uh, the, the fact that many Yoruba people don't write Yoruba, many Yoruba people don't read Yoruba, many people, 
Yoruba we don't even think it's important to write or read Yoruba. And that's why um, um, Professor Taiwo talked about a 40 million market. Unfortunately, the Yoruba language does not have a 40 million market. The, 40, the, 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 the large proportion of that 40 million market it has been sold to English. And that's why the language finds itself uh, where it is. I find uh, Professor Amidu's um, um, reference to Ajami interesting. Uh, it's a subject I'm very, very interested in. I've been trying to find, um, I've been studying pre-Christian, I'm interested in pre-Christian Yoruba uh, thought. And I have had the good fortune of coming across some Ajami scripts and uh, uh, to be able to find uh, some of these things. But the Ajami itself suffered from the same problem Latin uh, suffered for much less. Um, I'm sure Professor Amidu is, is, is aware of the statement, Alain Jami, Alain Jami, ye. Yeah, sure. That it is sometimes only the writer of Ajami that can decrypt what he has written. And that also holds for even Hausa, uh, in which Ajami is a lot more successfully written. They say in Hausa, Ajami Gagara Meishi that Ajami sometimes confound even the writer. And this is because of the um, lack of standardization. When scholars uh, develop a language, develop a writing system in their silos, it's the same thing we experienced in the last 15 to 20 years in ICT where somebody develops some system of writing Yoruba on the computer, sends it somewhere else, and it comes out as gibberish. And that is the same situation that occurred uh, in the 18th century, the 17th, 18th, 19th century, when the position Alan Jami, Alan Jami Ye, came in Yoruba, and in Hausa, Ajami Gagara Meishi. Thank you. Um, can I say something? I, I don't know whether I'm understanding the question, but we do have standardized Yoruba already. You can't have a language in which people are writing doctoral dissertations in the language and say that those dissertations are written in dialect. They are not written in dialect. In fact, that is what separates Yoruba from some other Nigerian languages. You know, uh, my Ikiti friends can complain about how the Oyo people, you know, have imperialized them. That's okay. The truth of the matter is that the Yoruba that is taught formally is what, as in English, people will call the RP, you know. And unfortunately, to go back to what uh, Dr. Adebola just said, because we do not have a quality control mechanism. You find even academic books that write about particular regions of Yoruba. Igbono is the most serious for me, where people actually do field work and transcribe in the dialect and present it as if it's standard Yoruba. So that those who do not know the dialect who are reading it, the stuff does not make sense to them because they don't know the dialect. And they think, okay, but it's Yoruba, so why am I having, you know, all these difficulties? So what that calls for, again, for me, is for scholars of this language to begin to take our job seriously <laughs> in terms of cleaning up the mess. In every other culture, that is what their scholars do. That's what we're failing to do. And that's not to say that there have not been any efforts I think we need to remember the work of the Agbe Onime de Yoruba, you know, uh, the attempt, you know, to create Yoruba meta languages, you know, uh, back in the 80s uh, and 90s. And the fact that, you know, until three years ago, there are new works coming out from Professor Yolana and Awobului, you know, on how to write Yoruba properly, incorporating many of the changes that Professor Baba mentioned and bringing them to, to this point. 
uh, again, if people took seriously formal education in the language, they will seek out all these things. So all of us who learn other languages, whether it's German or it's French, we know that we cannot just go anywhere and grab whatever we see and then write it and say that, yes, you know, we have written this German, you know. I think Yoruba needs to develop, you know, towards that. And we do have the resources. Uh, Dr. Debola, in terms of market, I have to disagree with you. Again, Nigeria is where the leadership should come from. But when I have Garifuna people when I was in Seattle, who practically got me to organize a Yoruba language class for their Orisha community, we're not talking of small numbers. When Professor Lupono held a conference on IFA at Harvard University in 2008, the hall was filled to rafters for the three days and 90% of the people who were there were not from Nigeria, they are all diasporic. So people are looking for leadership. People are looking for instruction. We are not offering it. That's what I'm trying to say. And if I may add one thing, um, something I've often uh, lamented is the absence of a monolingual dictionary of Yoruba. <clears throat> Most dictionaries you find are bilingual as if you know, you're catering to somebody translating from one language to another rather than dictionaries that actually serve those who speak the language as first languages or you know, people who want to use the language um, you know, for other purposes. So that's one of the reasons we are trying to create a, a monolingual dictionary at yorubaword.com. You know, we had Yoruba name for names, but we're trying to have yorubaword.com where, where the definitions of the words are in Yoruba specifically. Um, and then English is just perhaps there somewhere in the bottom just for people who care for just translation of words. But I think it's important to have a language to have that kind of resource um, as, as a way of you know, helping the language grow. And another way, of course, is also translations. We think we've, we've had many people talk about translations uh, into English. Uh, my work in literature, you find a lot of grants for translating works into English, but very few to translate works into Nigerian languages, into Yoruba, for instance. And this is not a fault of foreigners who, of course, uh, would not put money down to translate works into other people's languages, but us and our elites and people who have the money and the resources uh, who have not paid as much attention to that space. As we know in language technology, uh, Dr. Adibola as uh, if we can create a corpus of the language um, on the internet, it helps in several other ways. People who are trying to create technological tools will have a lot of things to work with. Now, on to be, before the BBC came, you couldn't find a website where you could find a properly marked um, Yoruba sentence, you know, that you can rely on. Even the BBC now still makes, you know, occasionally makes mistakes or sometimes doesn't use, uh, you know, don't use the tone marks as, as they should. But the more people write in the language, the more resources are created, the more people translate into the language, the more people publish in the language, the more resources are created. It's the irony, of course, that uh, when the British were around or, or, or in charge of the Nigerian publishing industry, there was a lot of more po books published in Yoruba, from Fagmoa to Paliti to et cetera. We are in charge of the publishing industry in Nigeria now, and you don't have as many new works being published in the language. So there's a lot of things we have to do by ourselves. Uh, and I think that that's an important, important way to go. Okay, thank you very much uh, for those answers. Um, actually preempted some of the questions I had. So um, I'll ask some that came from um, the uh, attendees. <clears throat> so um, some historical questions, actually. Um, anybody can answer. Uh, this, this one is from uh, Fade Kumayo who asked, uh, why did uh, Bishop Crowther write the Yoruba Bible? Um, was it part of sort of a Christian mission drive to spread religion as influence? Um, or was it done in any way to protect the language? Um, anyone want to answer this, this question? Well, Baba, I think he's done, he's done some work in from Baba, do you want to? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the first thing the that missionaries had to do was to translate sacred texts into the, especially Protestant missionaries, to translate texts into local languages so that they could evangelize more efficiently and more quickly than it would than it would be possible if they had to teach everybody to read 
English or whatever the language of the mission missionaries was. So basically, huge amounts of linguistic work were done, and of course not greatly appreciated anymore by these early missionaries. The first thing they did was to bring a printing press and to start producing uh, translations of biblical texts. So that's what it was for. Um, but it had enormous consequences because people in the, in the area didn't confine themselves to using these technological resources for, for religious purposes. And very quickly you get newspapers and uh, all kinds of texts written uh, and printed by people who are not part of the missionary effort. So it was taken over very quickly, especially in southwestern Nigeria, where you get independent Yoruba language publishing as early as the 1870s, 1860s. So I would say that the missionaries didn't know what they were unleashing. If I may add to that. Yeah, I think I printed you the last time, sorry. Dr. <laughs> yes, um, it, 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 interesting, um, uh, uh, Professor Baba's um, um, perspective there. Uh, for me, basically, the, there was this interaction between a religion of the book and an oral culture. That was the situation that um, uh, ensued when Christianity was introduced to Yoruba land. And um, the, the, the missionaries needed to get texts of this religion of the book to a people that uh, are fundamentally oral. I mean, like Walter Ong will say, people with a high oral residue. And um, <clears throat> the people who were eager to uh, embrace uh, literacy and uh, the, 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 the missionaries were surprised at, at the rate at which uh, li literacy spread. Um, but the interesting thing is that uh, probably 200, 150 years later, there is now a resurgence in origin. Because you hardly go into any church today and you won't find people uh, um, doing oriki or olodumari, oriki along, oriki jesu and such things. So you, um, the, 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 there's a pent up energy that the duality of orator and literature has released uh, into the Yoruba uh, uh, society. Uh, but this is not, it's not um, only, it didn't happen only with the Yoruba. You find that most parts of the world, it is a religion that develops language, uh, lit literacy, even oriture. Uh, traditionally, it's, I mean, Professor Amido referred to the effect of uh, Islamic writing in Yor on Yoruba even before Christianity came. So it's always religion that gives that. Uh, the, uh, religious people have the sufficient energy to do what is necessary. I mean, you talked about um, uh, the what BBC has done in making Yoruba available online. I mean, what BBC has done is a joke compared to what the Jehovah's Witness have done. Yep, that's uh, true. So you find that religious favor, you cannot discount it in the development of language. Very interesting. Yeah, that's very really, that's that's very true. I think I've I've noticed that sort of in various contexts, the the language uh, religion being a driver for um, maybe language revitalization or language preservation documentation. Um, yeah, very interesting to. By the to... way, Kumi, sorry before you go on, there's something I I just re remembered I could I could add to what Dr. Adibola mm -hmm. said. When I was growing up in about um, the the most of the churches that we 
that we saw and some of which we attended had Yoruba services first, uh, mostly in Yoruba. So most of Yoruba I acquired was from, you know, interacting with so many other spaces, including the church where every, the service from beginning to end was in Yoruba, the songs, everything. When we were growing up, after a while, we started having interpretations where the pastor would speak in Yoruba and then there would be someone who spoke in English to interpret what he was saying. That also helped in helping the young child understand both Yoruba and English. But after a while, we got to a point when the pastor started um, preaching in English and then having somebody interpret in Yoruba. And that's when the influence of English totally took over. An ex example of a church I remember uh, being like this was Sisi Agbalai Tura, where by you know, a couple of years ago, the pastor who originally preached only in Yoruba started preaching in English. And then mm -hmm. you know, sometimes you have a translation uh, or sometimes you didn't and you just have a second service as in English. So there is also a problem as well that has also affected religion, in which case English, the, the, the predominance of English in globalization and modern times has also kind of you know, removed the effect that your, uh, the church and religion could have had in helping the language grow and spread. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting point. But actually, it leads quite nicely onto some uh, other questions I was going to ask from audience members or our participants um, about English and the effect of English or loan words, and primarily they're borrowed from English on Yoruba and also on uh, how we mark the, those words with tone. So one question was, um, is it impossible to tone mark a borrowed word? Table, for example, has no direct translation in Yoruba. So is it important or necessary to tone mark um, tabili? They wrote tabili with no tone marks. So again, I don't know how- I would say yes. Say, mm. I'd say yes, that, I mean, that happens in, in many, when, when restaurant became an English word from French, I think it's, yeah, yeah people call it restaurants. And, that's just what it is. When it comes into a language, it becomes part of that language. And we, we treat it as, as, as how we treat other words in the language. I think that's, that's how, my own attitude to it in any case. I, 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 I give the example of Baba earlier on. Yes. I mean, if you don't exactly. stone mark Baba, you will mistake it for Baba or for exactly. Baba or, or exactly. for Baba. I mean, it, it, uh, the language is essentially a tone language. And when you loan words into the language, the, 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 loan, the loan words have to uh, be, 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 obey the phonology of the language. Yeah. Somebody How was saying to share it. Okay. There are some other examples of words that don't actually change, maybe in English from French, but it's not in all cases. It, 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 it will come down to style. Like, you know, New Yorker would write probably a word without any of the markings from the language from which it came. Maybe New York Times would do it differently. Uh, so, I mean, the variations happen, but mostly the languages, when, when, when you import a word, you just, the word becomes part of the new language. Karen Baba, sorry, I, I interrupted. No, I was just going to say, instead of saying Baba, you could say Nimba Jamo. That would solve yeah. the problem. <laughs> but that is also uh, a loan word for Malawi. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> and for all people who have those anxieties, we have a world famous example. It's called English. End of story. Yeah. So I, you know, anyway, yeah, that's all I'll say. <laughs> a a follow-on question for that was, what do we do about the new anglicized tr uh, translations or anglicizations um, of words like uh, radio for radio? Um, this uh, uh, attendee, Ayudele, um, said, I remember it used to be with error, I don't know this word, asoro. Asoro magbesi. Asoro magbesi, yeah. Asoro magbesi. Um, so now many Yoruba school textbooks just translate it as radio and with television. So what, what do we do, I guess, is, is the thing, is the question being asked. Do you have a solution? Okay. Are you if happy I may. With if I may, I, I think there are different ways in which um, to write a language. Uh, like in English, you would find uh, people who write in you know, highly poetic forms. Uh, you find people who write in very playful forms. You write people who write in ebonics, et cetera, especially in literature. I think literature perhaps gives you the most liberty to try and do several different things with language. There's not just one way in which Yoruba should exist. Um, while I was translating uh, the short story I mentioned earlier, Chimamanda's 
uh, the theme of the, of the work and the way uh, the characters interact with each other de determined the type of language I put in the mouth, uh, the way I, I, I translated the work from English into Yoruba. And I think that would matter. If you're translating the Bible, there is a formal way in which you, you know, try to put the language down. If you're translating um, an interaction between two high schoolers or two people you know, in a club, there's a certain Yoruba you can put in the mouth. So I think all of those things can exist. You can have the imported words. Um, languages grow by importing words anyway. Um, so there's nothing wrong with that. But you can also have the, the um, original you know, uh, interpretations from or the original translations that, you know, uh, that exist. I think there's enough space for all of it. Okay. We had so many more questions, but I don't know if we have time to get through them all. We had one that was potentially, uh, I don't know, uh, a critique maybe. Um, so um, the person who asked this question is just Kay. So having listened to the speakers, um, they say that it's clear that the panel consists of a sort of hardcore adherence to the status quo for whom the use of diacritics and subducts is non-negotiable. Uh, if you agree with that, the question is, um, is there any room for compromise at all? And will the panel be willing to explore what form that compromise could look like? Do we have to? I mean, we can read some people, um, as Karen mentioned, were able to read Yoruba without the, the marks before they were sort of standardized. So is there any room for compromise? I say something about that. I believe, and Kola can correct me, that the Yoruba Orthography Committee, when it made its recommendations in 1969, was it? Didn't say it's that done. everything has to be completely um, subdotted and tone marked. It was quite acceptable to use just subdots, which are, as you said, vowel quality. You can't, you can't write the vowel R without a subdot. But it seemed to be that the, you could add tone marks for purposes of disambiguation. But where there's a, a really well-known string of words that nobody would misunderstand, then it may not be considered necessary to use tone marks. I think that's what the recommendation was. But to me, the problem with that is that you have many words which don't carry tone marks because they're on midterms, so Asha or Mo. Now, how, if I don't know in advance, how do I know that this is not, um, th this is a word that, that should or should not carry tone marks? If you only tone mark certain words for purposes of disambiguation, that's why I think consistency all the way through is a better solution. But it's not impossible to to just use tone marks when you want to disambiguate. People have, have done that very successfully. Yeah. And I would say that even present day newspapers often don't fully tone mark the text and it's still perfectly comprehensible. So it's the subdots that are important. But what's weird is that because people have accents, you know, French accents in their symbol sets, and they don't have subdots. I've seen a lot of texts where people have tone marked but not subdotted, which is not <laughs> right. really, that's not even minimal best practice. But I think right. it's, I think it is negotiable. I mean, I said that the university, uh, the uh, Department of African Languages and Literatures said it was non-negotiable, but that's because they were training specialists in Yoruba language and literature who were going to get degrees written in Yoruba language. But for many purposes, you actually can get away without using the tone marks. And if it's easier and quicker, then why not? May I? And, uh, yes, go on, sir. Um, my um, problem is a little different because what I'm trying to do is to get computers to read Yoruba to people. And uh, without the tone marks, the computer mm -hmm. is lost. Mm -hmm. And um, I, 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 I don't think, um, I, I know Kola very well. I know 
Professor Baba's work. I think I've uh, read uh, uh, Professor Taiwo uh, on issues. I don't think we are being hard, uh, uh, not taking a hard position. But the question is, to what is the objective of compromise? Why do we want to um, shift position on tone marking? Is it because it's difficult? Is it because somebody is lazy to do it? I, my experience is that m the problem comes from so many years of literacy in English that yep. we now see Yoruba as unnecessarily difficult. Uh, whereas the, the Chinese who write it differently didn't see it difficult. The, I, I happen to have worked with a, a friend who was developing um, um, keyboards for Amharic. This, they, they had this problem long, long, long time ago because they used their language. And uh, when computers came, the Ethiopians had to solve the problem of writing Am Amharic on the computer. Whilst we were playing around with a, a sub dot or no sub dot, tone mark or no tone, tone mark, the reason why we are asking for a compromise is because we, we, we have been distracted by English. English is not a tone language. Uh, and uh, 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 should we also argue for relaxing the spelling rules of English, if we are asking for negotiation in tone marking, I think that is the way we should look at it. I think hmm. the answer there is then no. <laughs> add, add one little thing to Dr. Nicholas, um, who also uh, you know who works in technology. He has mentioned a num you know the the crucial thing, which is that you know in language technology we are trying to 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 help you know to to allow to make computer be able to read and, and, and understand Yoruba. And to do that, it needs to understand the system as it exists. But I think there's also some other solution that we as technology, as people work in technology should, might also be able to consider. Um, when we're talking about uh, automatic um, uh, tone application, um, which you know, a number of people have done some work in that, I, I think Dr. Dibola probably has as well. Um, it's probably a, a solution that can help um, not uh, not to, to to prevent people from learning how to tone mark because I think it's a good skill to have as a as a Yoruba speaker and that we should put in our educational system uh, uh, from from the time children are young. But um, for the um, technological age, it might also help, uh, especially for those who don't speak Yoruba as a first language, uh, to have um, programs like artificial intelligence enhanced programs that can understand from contexts that when somebody writes a sentence without any tone marks, uh, this might be what they mean. It's, it will take a while to get there, and many of us are working in that regard, but that's also a potential solution. But the aim of the solution, again, is not to prevent people from actually learning to use it, uh, to, to learn how tone marking works, because the language is a tone mark language. It is to help those who might not know how to do it, to still be able to cope uh, with the restrictions and the problems that technology provides. I think we should set up a market in training people all over the world. I have not heard the kind of case you just made, Kola, made by anybody learning Chinese right now. And Chinese is not the easiest language to learn. I mean, why are we always open to this? Let's make no, it easier. No, no, no. But when you write French on Microsoft Word, it can correct you. When you write English, they are autocorrects. We need solutions like that help as well. We have. Yeah, um, we can do that. So go right ahead. You guys who are in technology, please do. But I'm saying the, <laughs> the motivation should not be to make things easier for people. The motivation should be to get people to learn things the right way. And there are right and wrong ways. I teach in America. I always tell my students, they speak American, I speak English. <laughs> that's what, that's how you know the variations that you're dealing with, you know, even for a language that is supposed to be standard all over the place. Australian, you know, and look, 
I'm with Dr. Adebola and uh, Professor Baba. You know, for me, the issue is how do we create the institutions that will enable people to have help when they need it? That's it. I think it's uh, both of those things that sort of have to come together. Technology has to play a part in that. Otherwise, why are we writing yeah. in Yoruba if, um, as um, Professor Adebola said before, like the market of people writing Yoruba is not even as big as the people who are speaking it. So um, technology has to play, play a part. Um, I wish we had more time to talk more and ask more questions. We had so many questions from so many people and we didn't even get a chance to ask everybody who wanted to uh, ask their own questions to come and join us. Um, however, I'm going to ask um, Professor uh, Saheed Aderito Ade um, to give the uh, closing remarks. He's the president of the Lagos Studies Association. Um, I believe your camera is a bit skewed. <laughs> okay. So if you can switch it so that we can um, see you, or so we can hear you. Um, just Should for the closing like remarks. That's it. I thought I I thought I had it the right direction. Can you no. hear me now? Yes, no. we can. Okay, I, I was I, I thought I was gonna talk tomorrow. I I actually didn't know I was I was uh, scheduled to talk today. Is that right? To, but nonetheless, uh, I would like to thank all the presenters uh, for their for their nice uh, presentation. Uh, Professor Femi Taiwo, uh, Professor Agbola, and um, and uh, Kola Tubosu. I, I think that the conversations we're having today, are, they, are, they are really significant conversations around the relationship between the way we write Yoruba and uh, other dynamics, especially the technology and the socioeconomic uh, implication. And I really like the discussion, especially about the globalization of the language itself how to make the language accessible um, to multiple audience and the problematics of uh, the different dialects that we have and the implication of these problematics. For example, I love the conversation about Ugomina and I think how, uh, how ethnography is conducted in one particular so, uh, uh, social, uh, social group, it, Yoruba sub social grouping, and then had to be translated into Yoruba, They're, you know, or then the implication of this. So I think that these are, this is a very important conversation and the conversation should continue. It should continue within the context of the issues we've raised today about technology, very important, about the political economy of language, and of course about the globalization of the language. And also that's also continue within the context of academics and intellectuals um, consistently having significant interface with the regular or daily users of the language. I like the conversation about the fact that when we listen to a Yoruba program on Radio Nigeria today or any of the Nigerian radio stations, the amount of uh, new Yoruba words that is mobilized to express and I mean, it's just fascinating the fact that these Yoruba presenters are actually knowledge producers. And the way they produce knowledge is so fascinating. It's not because they were, they're not only shaping the ways people speak the language, the way they speak is also a function of what people say on a daily basis. And the, the, the dexterity, the, the amount of, um, uh, the way they mobilize um, on different variations or variants of uh, uh, speaking the language itself is so interesting. I think we should have conversation with um, uh, people like radio presenters. I think it would be nice for us, next time if Kola is gonna do this or the British uh, Library, I think it would be nice to, in, to, to invite um, Yoruba radio presenters to ask them specific questions about how uh, these uh, new vocabularies are generated, and not just from by their own perspective, but for, for the perspective of listeners who also shape the way they communicate. And of course, to also be specific about the historicity of this, right? I mean, I would like to specifically mention Colas dad. When I was having discussion with him about my present research, that was when I got to know that he was a presenter at WNBC and it was during the course of uh, anchoring programs that he got interested in Yoruba um, performance culture and was inviting all these uh, performers and drummers to the studio to perform. The point in emphasis is that the history of this transformation in our radio shapes, the radio program shapes public usage of language is very important. So that when we talk about contemporary producers of programs on, on the radio, we should also be 
uh, careful to understand it from the historical perspective, given the fact that this just did not evolve over time. I would like to give another presentation because I think that the presentations we have today, including the contribution by Professor Karim Baba, they've done very good justice to this. I would like again to thank um, Kola, the British Library for doing this and uh, the, the presenters for this great, um, they are great presentation. I think this is a nice collaboration with the Lagos Studies Association and, I'm, and I look forward to further collaborations. Thank you so much. Thank you, Saeed. Thank you very much, um, Professor Saeed Adarinto. Um, and thank you everybody for for joining and attending. Like I said, we had so many more questions that we could have asked, um, but um, maybe tomorrow. I hope uh, you'll be able to join the event uh, tomorrow at the same time from 3 uh, p.m. And uh, I would just like to say thank you very much to um, all our panelists, um, Professor Femi, uh, Olufemi Taiwo, Kola Tubosum, to Professor Karen Barber, um, and to Dr. Tunde um, Adebola. Um, very, very interesting discussions we've had here. And I think, yeah, the point of this event was to start a, a conversation about how uh, we can write <laughs> Yoruba going forward, making it relevant in the digital age. So I hope uh, most of you will be able to join at uh, tomorrow's symposium again. Thank you very much. And just to say that this recording will be made available in case anyone asks on the British Library YouTube page. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I think uh, Marion wants to say something. Before we leave. <laughs> she says no. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to, but, but anyway, yes, thank you all so much for coming and attending and it's been absolutely fascinating and I look forward to seeing you all hearing from you tomorrow. Um, Thank you, Marion. Thank you, everyone. Okay, take Later. care. Thank you.